Well, here we are. It is Friday, July 21st, 2023. And this is, of course, the weekly video. I do these every Friday. I say this every week. I'll say it forever every week for newcomers. Uh, we do weekly videos on the Asian art market, the Chinese art market, Japanese art, what's happening in Hong Kong, New York, the major fields, and then, of course, the major auction places, as well as uh, what's happening on live auctioneers and Invaluable and bid eBay and everywhere else, every place, Chinese, every place where Chinese antiques are being sold. We try to talk about it and Japanese art and so forth. So here we are. And if you're not a subscriber yet, uh, subscribe to us here on YouTube and come over to our website, uh, bitamount.com and uh, use the newsletter, the forum page. You can join the forum. It's all free. Uh, we do have a, a private paid section that you can learn about after you've been there for a while, but uh, come over and use the site anyway, just for fun. And uh, one of the things we have is the weekly newsletter. And we do this every Friday. We talk about things that were posted on eBay the previous uh, week in this part of the video. We'll talk about what they brought, and then we'll show you some things that are coming up that we've seen that we we put in the newsletter page. Um, uh, some of you may not know it. Most of you do that everything that is on this page we looked at and uh, decided that it looks pretty good. But one of the things we do every week also is we look at a lot of fakes and copies. And there are two sellers on uh, eBay that I'm going to talk about shortly um, that are just, uh, they're making bank on selling fakes. And it's its unbelievable. And I hope none of you are, are involved in it and, 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 and making money or, or spending money on this stuff because it's just awful. But uh, we're going to get to that in a minute. Before we do, though, I want to talk about an auction that took place over the weekend up in New Hampshire, not far from here. And the auctioneer is a, a fellow I've known for many years, um, uh, Devin Moisen. He's a good auctioneer. He started his career working with Northeast Auctions. Uh, the the, the uh, Ronald Bourgeau, who was um, arguably one of the ran one of the best auction houses that's ever existed in America, and that includes the majors in New York. Um, he was a very well liked guy, and Devin cut his teeth working with him and um, knew a, a great deal on his own and so forth. He's a good auctioneer. That's all I'm just trying to say. Um, uh, there's certain auctioneers I, I like a lot, and Devin is one of them. And uh, if some of you remember, last week we talked about this Satsuma charger. And as a lot of you know, it's, Japanese stuff has sort of been in the in the dumper for the last uh, 15 or 20 years because of the changes in the economy and the sudden in resurgence of, of wealth coming out of uh, new money, coming out of China, buying up Chinese art. Well, anyway, there was this this charger, this was thing was about 24 inches in diameter, just a little under, 23 and three quarters, I think, with the measurements on it. It was a great piece of Satsuma, and it was estimated moderately, at, you know, 800 to a thousand dollars. And uh, this sold last weekend, and it ended up selling for 5,500 plus the buyer's premium. So it ended up selling for about 7,500 or 7,000 dollars, which is a pretty strong price. But it was a great piece of Satsuma, and we talked about it, and um, uh, it was marked, of course, on the back. Uh, and uh, here's a here's an interesting shot. What they do to, is a silhouette showing you how large it is compared to the size of a human. And it's a big, big piece of ceramic and ended up selling for uh, a very, very strong price, as did this, this uh, the armorial platter. It had a chip out of it in the corner here, but a very rare one, beautifully painted 18th century armorial ware. Um, sold for 3500 against a five to $700 estimate, which we said last week when we talked about, it's just Devin's way of saying there's no reserve on this stuff. Um, he also had a lot of great American furniture. If, you, if you're looking for good Americana, he, he sells a great deal of it and, and European decorative art and all the other stuff. Um, uh, this one was uh, the, the Arms of Caulfield, um, Earl of uh, Clare, uh, uh, Charlemont, um, done in 1783, beautiful quality, um, and brought a good price upwards of, uh, just about just a little under probably, uh, uh around 4,500 to $5,000 with the buyer's premium. Next up was this, this was astounding. This was an amazing price. Now these were really lovely plates and we talked about them last week. They're 10 and a quarter or 10, a little over 10 inches in diameter, um, uh, circa 1830 or so early, uh, Rose Mandarin, uh, plates, the rims all, uh, are matte. Uh, but all, each has a different scene within it, meticulously painted, beautiful, beautiful quality. And wait, do you see the price for these? And you see these come up, right? And, and this may be, you know, a hopeful sign for some of these uh, Mandarin wares. Um, this, this, these were estimated at three to five hundred dollars, which seemed a, a bit on the low side to us, even. But, but you know, okay. Uh, I, I thought they'd be worth six or seven hundred bucks a piece. Um, and look at the price; they went for almost, almost. Um, 
2000 a piece plus the premium. Keep that in mind. So they ended up going for around $7,800, over $1,000 a bowl, but beautiful quality. And um, uh, he did a good job advertising the auction. And that's the power of advertising. Very fine examples, very strong prices. As with this, now this is this is a pattern of these Celadon glaze Mandarin wares. This one is superbly decorated, though, with Mandarin scenes rather than just flowers or and birds and so forth. It's Mandarin interior scenes or a, a terrace scenes. You have a, a, like an empress sitting in the doorway here and a gentleman playing an instrument outside and somebody bringing tea and all this other good stuff. The quality of the decoration, though, here is the thing you want to pay attention to. There are lots of varieties of this type of plate floating around, lots and lots and lots of them. And most of them are lower quality. Most of them are not this well done. Um, and that's the difference because I, I know I know many of you may even have some of these, but you have to compare quality for quality and top quality always brings the best price. And in this case, this this thing went with one hundred and fifty to two hundred dollar estimate, ended up selling. That was 13 inches in diameter. It was a big plate, not enormous, but big and sold for fifty seven fifty plus the premium. So about seventy four or five hundred dollars for that, I would guess somewhere around there. Uh, again, a very strong price, quite astounding. And um, this was a, a really nice piece of Kutani. Um, I, had, I had left a small bit on it just to just to keep it on my radar screen because I was really curious to see what it would bring. I didn't leave a lot. I think I left two or three hundred bucks on it or something. I knew it would beat that. This was a very nice piece of Kutani, beautifully done, femi noir body, flowers all over it. Had a crack in the bottom, but the, the size was amazing. This was a big piece of Kutani, heavy, done during the probably during the, the Meiji period, maybe a little before um, outstanding, ended up selling for nine hundred dollars with a cracked base. And then um, and then there was this service. That was the end of the Devon sale. He also had a, he had, a, he had some very good snuff bottles that uh, uh, one of them was a very contemporary example, but done by a famous decorator that brought around twenty thousand dollars with the buyer's premium. Uh, but then there was this. This was at the Heinemann sale um, that took place. And many of you remember we had this uh, featured on the homepage, <clears throat> a very nice example uh, for the Indian market, a uh, gentleman riding the elephant. Really, really, really lovely. And there was something like 47 pieces in this set. This was a very, very big set, including four candlesticks, which are quite rare. And then, of course, the terrines, the big platters and so forth. Um, think of it this way. It was 47 pieces, but just one of these plates when they come on the market, because we've seen this pattern before, sell for $1,500 to $2,000. They do very, very well. So here you have a whole service of them um, nicely photographed. They all look like they were in very, very good condition, uh, beautifully enameled and so forth, and it ended up doing extremely well. They brought $60,000 for the service uh, plus premium. So you're up around uh, 80000 by the time you're done uh, paying for them. Really, really nice pieces. Extremely nice. So overall, it, it appears even though we're in the, in the middle of summer and there are not a lot of auctions on live auctioneers right now, as I've said before, it happens every year for July and August. The European market gets unbelievably quiet. They're all done over there. They're not going to do anything until September. And uh, the U.S. market is sort of along the same lines in some areas. You don't see quite as many auctions as you do typically. People are on vacation, doing things. They've got company. The kids are home. You know, the whole thing. So uh, there we are. So it's a good time to, to, to poke around, though, because there there were also some sales with, with, on live auctioneers last week. We saw some fantastic bargains just due to a lack of audience um, right now. Um, um, but uh, this sale did well because Moisen does a good job advertising up there. So anyway, keep that in mind. Now, I want to get on to it. This is a sort of a sensitive topic. And every time I get into this, I end up getting nasty emails from people. But and uh, sometimes critical comments, but that's okay. I'm going to say what I think, all right? There are two auction houses right now that sell on eBay that are selling, in my opinion, mostly fakes and copies, all right? I, I can't say 100% because I don't look at 100% of everything they sell, so i got to be fair about it and say mostly, all right? Okay, this is one of them, and I've talked about them before, but it's really getting out of hand. This is the seller down in Rhode Island who used to sell good stuff. Um, they used to do a really good job. They sold nice Chinese export stuff, and they sold things that turned up in local auctions. This is Woolworth, and every, 
All of these imperial pieces that they have here are fakes. These are all fakes, pure fakes. And I want to go through them because it's it's getting into some serious money. $3,550, $2,225, $709, $2,125. And all of these can be bought all of Alibaba or in China for 200 bucks as decorations, 300 bucks. You can you, you see them all the time. All right. These are fakes. I know some of them look very, very convincing, perhaps to some of you. These are fakes. These are all repros. Even this Tung Chi looking dish. This is a brand new. I looked at it a while ago. Sold for eleven hundred and fifty three dollars. It's a it's a modern copy. They are making modern copies of Tung Chi plates and Dao Guan plates and Jai Jing plates. Um, and at any rate, just, you know, it's, it's just maddening. It's maddening to me to see people who get interested in art and antiques and they get absolutely taken. And the reason that people are buying them is because um, uh, what was guaranteed, well, in their thing, guaranteed authentic, no reserve. And this is what they put on their listings. Well, and they say they'll take them back. Well, they have to take them back. If, if you buy something on eBay and you don't like it, almost for any reason at all, you can return it. That's part of the deal. So what they're doing is they're, they're sort of getting out in front of that and saying, oh, but we're, we guarantee it. <clears throat> and we'll take it back. Yeah, they have to. It's, this isn't a negotiable thing, but they're trying to turn it into a positive. This is a uh, uh, this is closing today. It's got a Young Chen mark on it. This this is a brand new brush washer, brand new, made uh, probably within the last three or four years. And uh, in the listing, it says it's coming out of an old collection. Yada da da yada da yada da. Young Chen period. Uh, all of this guaranteed that the, we'll be totally satisfied with age, quality, and condition. The problem is that most people that are bidding on this stuff, the person that bought this, I can guarantee you, has never that is going to end up with this. Has never seen a real Young Chen water pot in his life. And uh, he's going to think it's real, and that's going to be the end of it. And it's going to end up selling probably for more than it is now. And right now it's at $2,225, and it's going to end up selling for more. And somebody's out thousands of dollars for something they could pick up in a junk shop in Hong Kong or Shanghai for under 75 or 100 bucks. Okay, that's simply the matter of it. Here's one that sold. This one uh, sold on July 7th. It's, it's uh, many of you that have been collecting. A lot of you will instantly recognize what this is supposed to be. Is among the rarest of all the rare Kangxi pieces. The underglazed red water pot. Um, uh, absolutely uh, phenomenally rare. And it's this thing allegedly is mark and period. All right. It is not. This is also a brand new fake. And uh, you don't have to look at it hard. If you've seen a few of them, even just go over to Christie's and look at a few pictures of the ones they've sold. Um, the first thing you notice right away is this sort of sickly green ground, the way the mark is done. And then the foot rim, of course. The underglazed red decoration is 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 a little stiff. It's not quite what it should be, but it's just painting. And, and painting is painting. So... People are going to look at it and say, well, it looks old. It's a little blurry um, and that kind of thing. Well, they all look this way. This is how they turn out from the kiln, especially when you're dealing with copper red. Uh, and physics haven't changed in the last three or 400 years. So it's going to react the same way it would have originally in many instances. But there are little things that are obvious giveaways, not the least of which is that if this were authentic, um, this would be a five hundred dollars to seven hundred thousand dollar brush pot or more. All right. I mean, that's that's the big giveaway. The big giveaway is is that nobody who's a collector of long time because they claim this is coming from an old collection. Anybody who's been collecting for more than two weeks knows that if you have a major collection of authentic things, you don't send them to Woolworths, things that potentially are worth millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. You don't send them to a, an online eBay seller in Rhode Island um, and uh, expect to get a lot of, uh, you know, a huge price. All right. And whoever the whoever they're getting this stuff, they keep supplying them and they keep getting, you know, these these what would be ridiculously low prices uh, uh, if they were authentic, but very high prices for, for fakes. And these are fakes. All right. And this is another one that sold underglazed green celadon ground. Um, again, more mark and period Kang Shi wear brush pot. Uh, this is a total fake. Uh, you, everybody watching this video have probably owned a pair of shoes older than this. And this ended up uh, 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 selling for $416. All right. This vase is up currently. Uh, it's listed as a Wanli Markin period three color glazed vase. It's got 36 bigs. It, dids, it closes today and it's up to uh, uh, $1,555. This is a brand new vase, has zero age. 
and again, lots and lots of money and so forth. All right. Just so I'm just saying, if if you if you if you want to risk your money, uh, uh, buy it. But but it's it's really really it's just robbery is what it amounts to. It's just robbery. I, I know I'm not going to mince around with it. All right. And then you have this seller. This is ancient rhyme, and you'll see he's got 243 um, items on sale for sale right now on eBay. These are all the items he's sold. All of these are copies, 100 percent. 100% copies. You have lots of bronzes, lots of jades, lots of soapstone carvings. You've got uh, 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 things like like this uh, uh, familiar, this uh, uh, Dalsai enameled uh, vase going for $2,300. You've got this sort of Republican looking thing, but it's got a chin lung mark on the bottom, sold for 900. This pair of copies of bowls sold for 760, 710 for this blatant copy of a red glazed vase, um, double gourd yellow vase, brand new, brand new uh, uh, Phoenix jar and Dalsai enamels. And uh, very, very, among the rarest of all the Ming plates is this one, of course. And uh, here it just brought $1,525 instead of two or 300000 All right, and on and on and on. It's the same situation that we're seeing over at Woolworth. This is, they just have an endless supply of modern copies, which you can get, anybody can get them. And they're selling these, but look at the prices. And, and, and understand that these generally, all these pieces cost no more than a couple hundred dollars brand new. And that's where they're buying them. And look at the profit margins. Look at the profit margins. <clears throat> and that's why it's happening. This is one of the rarest, these grapes pattern plates, um, uh, one of the rarest of all of early blue and whites. They were. This is what the, the original models for Iznik wear in Turkey was copied when they began producing their own pottery in, in mimicking Chinese art. Um, all these fantastically rare examples. All right, all of them fakes and copies. All of them, <clears throat> and um, they sell. This sold for nine hundred. This sold for a thousand. No, it's, this hasn't sold yet. It's it closes in uh, uh, about a day. One day, seven hours. Excuse me. Uh, so, and this is a blatant brand new copy. All right, and um, you know, I know some some of you may be looking at it. Here it is with the chin lung mark. Boy, the mark has done well. One glance at that foot rim, even if you don't look at the rest of the vase, you know right away it's a modern copy, just as judging by the paste and the color. And here you have this, you know, very nicely painted. This is all hand decorated, but the colors are off. The decoration, the shading is wrong um, and so forth. It's a copy. That's all there is to it. So just a word to the wise. That's all I'm, I'm saying. I'm not going to, every once in a while, I'll remind all of you. And, and this is also say it for people that are new. Um, nobody sells Mark and period, Imperial Chin Lung and Kung Shi and Yong Chen vases on eBay um, that are worth a half a million to a million dollars um, um, and don't get it. If they're authentic, if you have authentic pieces, understand something. Um, people think they're getting a bargain because it's on eBay. If you have real mark and period material and you put it on eBay, you'll get the money. It'll come. You'll get the real money. You'll get fifty, eighty, a hundred thousand dollars. And I know this because I've done it. And we've sold some great mark and period pieces on here and done very, very well over the years. But it happens very, very rarely because you don't get them that often. And um, um, th that would be a good fit for eBay. All right. They have to be very uh, obvious, obvious in their authenticity. Uh, they have to have some sort of history background um, and so forth. In the past, when we've had things like this, we've had them from collections that we've sold. And um, um, many of the bidders knew. Um, in, in one case, we had many of the bidders knew who the family was that where we got the collection. It was uh, a couple of them were very large collections, but people out there were familiar. They knew the family um, and they knew of the authenticity, so you could sell it. So it's just this. It's just but this is all improbable. This is all just ridiculous. All right. So so. Woolworths and Ancient Rhyme, stay away from them. The other one, of course, is Superstore, which is the other big seller, but they sell very little material. If you look at their completed listings, um, they have a sell-through rate, of it looks like, of about 3%. Um, they also sell nothing but fakes and copies, all right? But uh, Woolworths and, and uh, Ancient Rhyme are among the two biggest offenders right now selling in the United States. This is a, a piece that Woolworths has right now. I, I had to show, show everybody. I had to laugh because the, this is advertised as a Kangxi um, uh, uh, brush washer in these colors. And uh, those of you that, that collect porcelain know that nothing in these colors was ever produced in the Kangxi kiln, ever, ever. 
just never did it. Uh, and it's up to two hundred thirty-five dollars. It closes today. It's probably going to go for maybe four or five hundred. But again, a blatant copy that most people have managed to avoid. But it's still going to bring, um, you know, three or four hundred dollars more than it's worth. All right. Now, uh, what's been going on uh, over on eBay this week? It was a pretty good week, uh, but there's some really good things coming up. I want everybody, if you sort of at this point, stick around for the, the few of the lots that are coming up this week because there's some really interesting lots. Last, last week was pretty good. Next, this coming week, it's got some, uh, I think, some absolutely fascinating items. Um, uh, this robe, uh, very s typical late Qing um, informal robe. With the figural uh, landscape scenes, nice border decoration, um, and so forth. <clears throat> now we say late Qing on this. It could have been made early in the Republic period too. It doesn't. There's not a big line dividing, you know, the, this kind of material. Like they didn't suddenly stop at the end of the Qing Dynasty and go to a whole new style just because the Imperial House collapsed. They kept making whatever they had been making before. And this is something I often say in my replies to people on, on videos: is that the is one period or dynastic era ended everything just didn't suddenly shift to something brand new it all evolved very slowly over time so you'll see lots of things made in the early republic period that were also being made during the late Qing and and earlier and you'll see things that were made in the late Qing that were made in the 18th century they keep reviving and coming back to things and it brings up the whole you know the whole interesting conversation about what's a fake and what's what's a a, a contemporary copy uh <laughs> It gets a little tricky. There's actually a, a Sotheby's SOAS uh, 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 pamphlet, PDF out there on it. Maybe I'll, I'll grab it and we'll talk about that sometime. Anyway, uh, $1,225. Um, nice looking robe. No buyer's premium on eBay, of course. So that's the net price plus shipping, which according to this, like this sold, was sold by a seller in New York out in Staten Island. Um, uh, it was only $10 to here, which is we're a couple hundred miles from there. So it's not bad. Um, and then there was this also from the same seller. They were the ones that had this really nifty um, hanging framed with the wave pattern, like you see on the bottoms of, uh, of robes down here at the bottom, this pattern. And then all these beautiful, beautiful flowers um, in blue shades of blues to white against a, a, a very fine um, uh, cobalt blue uh, background. This was a very nice bit of work here. Um, beautiful panel, good size, uh, ended up, uh, it was 54 by 37 inches. So it was three feet, um, going this way and, you know, a little, a little longer going the other way. I don't think this was a bad price. I think this was a really, I think somebody got a really good buy here. $385 for a beautiful piece of silk ready to hang. And I didn't see any damage. It was in very good condition. All right, it didn't have dragons or anything on it and, and creatures, and that, that will push the price. But still, beautiful work, especially the uh, elum or, or the bottom, the edge here with the waves. Really lovely. I like that a lot. And silks have remained very strong. Here's another one. This is a Republic silk, judging by these uh, sort of bright colors. Some of the bright pinks in there look Republic to me. And uh, the way the, the birds are stylized. Uh, they also did very similar rondelles with, with red-headed uh, herons in, on Japanese silks. Uh, but this is a, this is a perfectly nice one, probably from 1920 or to the 1930s. Uh, ended up selling for $595 because the work was good. The work was good. The condition was good. The colors were strong. And, uh, um, you know, it, it, you, you buy the work. You always pay for the work. Pay for the art. That's that's where that's where the value is, and uh, five ninety five for this, which was a good price. Somebody somebody that that was sold for a fairly strong price, but in beautiful condition. Um, and look, this it's the same seller that had all three of these silks. And so I should point out, Khan's antique. So he got in, he got into a house or a collection or something um, out there in Staten Island or somewhere around the area, and he he, he got maybe picked, hopefully he picked it all up at a yard sale for thirty dollars. <laughs> it's always nice when that happens. Anyway. Nice looking lot, and he did well with it. All right, and then over to this. This was a, a great, a great, Great Lakes antiquing um, out in Michigan. They they get things that are from time to time. They not huge sellers. They've been on eBay for a number of years, but they've gotten some nice things. Um, and they had this this nice little amber glaze, probably later 18th or possibly early 19th century uh, miniature bottle. And as we've known, we've talked about it before. Uh, miniatures um, have, have had a real uh, resurgence in interest lately. Uh, they were a big collectible among Chinese collectors back at the early uh, of the early part of the 20th century. 
between 1900 and 1930. There were a lot of little miniature collections built up. There was a huge interest in snuff bottles, porcelain bottles, glass snuff bottles, all these little delicate things because they were easy to bring home, easy to transport, and there were lots of them around. You could build a nice collection for yourself of different types of examples. And uh, this is probably about when this one came over at some point or where, you know, I don't know where it's been since. But it was a nice little bottle, very small, as you can see, but b based on a, on a well-known uh, form that you see in much larger pieces uh, and so forth. But at any rate, it sold for $395, which I think is perfectly good. Nice, nice item. And it paid a fair, somebody paid a fair, fair price for it. And then there was this, the Sung um, um, Junyao type bowl. And this is a provincial bowl. And as you can see, there's lots of kiln grit and cement and so forth still stuck to it from the, from the kiln. But the color was quite nice. This blue was quite appealing and very nicely put. Here's a, low, here's a side shot of it. It's not a deep bowl, obviously. It's a, a, a saucer, more or less, or a, a oil, oil, oil saucer, perhaps. Um, there it is. Uh, but nice color, nice, nice blue color and genuine. And the, the foot, except for all this degradus that's sort of stuck to it, it's, it's still nice looking. And it's very thickly glazed. The thickness of the glaze here is pretty staggering. At any rate, it was, it was a not perfectly nice piece, and it did fine. It brought $2,591. And they did keep making these also. They made these also. There was a revival of these in the Ming Dynasty, and they're often confused as being sunk. And there's a, a Ming one that's coming up in a minute, and we'll talk about that, and you'll see the difference, I think. All right, and then there was this, that beautiful reticulated double-walled cup in Famil Rose, 18th century Chinlung period, um, with these gilded reticulations going around it. Um, this, this was a really nice little set, and it did well. I'm going to show you the price in a minute. But I, I, we talked about it last week because I just thought it was so elegant. I thought it was really wonderful. And uh, it ended up doing pretty well for a cup and saucer, about $880. And as you've seen in the past, if they don't have this double walled business, um, just the a gilded cup and saucer of this quality decoration for Milrose, the price is usually in the in the in the two to three hundred dollar range. But you add this reticulation, drives the price up because this is a much more complicated piece of porcelain to create. It's double walled. So the bowl is inside behind that grid. There's a bowl. And um, I think we talked about it last week. There's the inside of it. So the reticulation goes around it. So it's like a bowl within a bowl, which is which is a rare. Uh, they usually get broken. It's a style that was developed during the Ming Dynasty and uh, came back in the 18th century on some export wares and, and other wares, or wear, domestic wares too. Ming Yao wares sometimes had them, um, but eight hundred and eighty dollars. Nice, nice price. Beautiful object. Beautiful set. And then there was this. This this was the uh, export uh, cup and saucer set. Um, uh, 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 I think it was Unity and Peace or something like that. It's a married couple out. They've got their bird. They're going out into the countryside. There are birds flying above them. She's opening the bird cage and so forth, which is sort of interesting because <clears throat> birding like this was more of a European thing. And these look like Europeans in China may be doing it. Liberty and ma matrimony is, is the pattern, as it's known. Um, fairly rare. And I think this was sort of a bargain. I think somebody got a really unusual, if you, th if you collect Chinese export wares, when was the last time you saw this pattern? You probably saw it five or 10 years ago at the most, at the earliest. Um, it's a rare pattern. And somebody picked it up for $190. Keep in mind that atypical patterns you can, sometimes can acquire for a bargain because there are people out there who are, we call comp buyers. They don't buy really with the heart. They they buy by comparison to other pieces because they they don't understand maybe what they're really looking at or they don't have a feeling for it. So they go and look up another example that looks just like this one. And what did that sell for? And that's how they make their they look for the comp, the comparable price. And uh, it's a very it's a sad way to collect. If you if you collect based on comps um, to get value, you 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 you're you're never going to develop your own instinct for what value is and what something should be worth. Um, develop your own taste, develop your own interest and pay for that and, and be willing to pay and put the money out there. If you find something you really, really like and it means you have to go over what they typically sell for, do it. Uh, because because it, it, it strengthens interest in the market, it strengthens uh, the collector's market, and it, 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 it helps focus people in on better examples over mediocre examples. So you, 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 high prices draw attention. All right, I'm not saying throw away a lot of money so somebody will look at them. I'm just saying, you know, don't be afraid of unusual items like this. 
<clears throat> and not bidding on them because you can't find something to compare the price to. What do you look at? Just look at the item. Forget the world. Just look at the item and say, "Wow, that thing is great. Those are really cool, interesting, and unusual." And be willing to pay the price. All right. And then there was this. This was an absolute bargain. One hundred eighty-eight dollars for Kangxi period um, Amari open salt. Um, uh, th these were made for export. Uh, open salts um, uh, for some reason, and I don't know why. Open salts used to bring a lot of money. People, I've said it before. People used to collect eight it's because they made most of them in the 18th century. Kangxi examples were the earliest examples of open salts, really, made in porcelain for export, and. Uh, um, just a simple uh, ch Chin Lung um, pair of open salts at auction in, in the 80s and 90s and so forth. They were they were selling for six to eight hundred dollars a pair, and uh, today that's just gone way. And I don't know why it's fallen off so much. Here you have a very rare type, very unusual, 188 dollars. And uh, I, you know, in, in back I mean, not that long ago, I would have thought, gee, that's a, a six or eight hundred dollar open salt, uh, but. It isn't, and, and now is your time to buy them. Just because they're not, the time to buy these things is when they're not bringing a lot of money, all right. And, um, uh, and and if you've always wanted to own one of these, this is the time to buy things like this because there will come a day when this thing is is going to be you know fifteen or twenty times more than this price. It will come. It will come. It always does. All right. And then there was this. This very interesting Daoguan Markin period uh, Qing bowl. This was um, uh, Stubbsy Wubsy had this over in the UK. Now the bowl had a, a significant break out of it, but it was a very nice um, uh, uh, coral red ground, a nice white decoration reversed into it. There's the mark. Um, precious objects, scrolls, and all this other business. And uh, it, it had a, a, a pretty significant uh, line in it. And had a big crack over here, uh, running down the side. Another crack over here. Had a chip out of it, and so forth. Um, all right. So it wasn't. It was a long way from perfect. And he sh he showed all the pictures. In fairness to him, he, he certainly did the right thing when he was offering it. And it still sold for sixteen hundred and four dollars because it's a rare type, interesting ground, and it was quite well done. So there you are. All right, and then over to this. This was a, a sort of a nifty buy. I threw this in at the end just because you don't see them all all that often. But this is a, a and, and they don't bring a lot of money anymore unless they're signed by done by famous artists. Uh, but this is a Japanese. They used to call them paper boxes, and uh, it's inlaid with mother of pearl. It's not perfect, um, which 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 among the collectors really just upsets them so much they don't pay anything for them. But this is a nice one. It has some nice inlay. It's probably um, late Meiji to, to early uh, uh, Showa period. It's got a little separation over here. But if you're not in the position to buy one for, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, five to seven thousand or three to five thousand that's signed, this is a very perfectly nice example. Nice warm color, nice lacquer work. It's got a few bumps in it, but it went for nothing. It went for seventy five dollars. Um, perfectly nice, genuine antique. And uh, it came from, I don't know the seller, but he apparently clears houses um, over in the UK. I think he's got a few things that are up or had a few things that were up last week. Uh, but this was one of them. And I think, you know, if you're, if you're learning about Japanese lacquer, or you're interested in Japanese lacquer, and you don't have a huge wallet to spend, not everybody can spend $20,000 or 10000 or fifteen. We throw these numbers around and you know, people forget that, you know, it, it's, this is money. This is, you know, it's, it's, it get pretty expensive. Uh, but there are lots of things out there if you want to collect that you want to enjoy uh, in the Chinese and Asian market that can be done um, with relatively small sums of small, small sums of money. It's, it's a very uh, sort of... It, you know, equal ground. And the more you learn, the, the better buys you can make with that limited funds. You're much better off um, um, uh, learning and uh, uh, what things are to make great buys for yourself to keep within your budget. Uh, but this was a perfectly good little lacquer box for $75. All right. Now, this week, we've, uh, we've uh, if many of you noticed, the uh, newsletter page, of course, is, is uh, presenting all the images. Um, we're still having trouble for some reason getting certain uh, listings out of Germany and Europe to display. Um, some do, some don't. So it really, really depends. Uh, but some of them, uh, for some reason, don't um, don't allow the images. Not I think is a governmental thing because it's, it's tied into Germans' pri uh, Europe's privacy laws. Also in the Netherlands, it's becoming a problem. I think so. There, there's something going on there. But uh, this is this week's, and there's some interesting things in here. I want to go through a couple of the highlights. One, there's a whole bunch of Chinese silver, and we'll talk about one of the silver pieces. But there's a bunch of Chinese silver lots. There's some nice porcelain, lots of 18th century 
country wears. And a couple of other things I want to point out. And one of them is this. Um, and this is uh, Stubbsy Wubsy. And he got this pair. He's called them 18 to 19th century bronze altar sticks. These are 18th century, in my opinion. I think these are terrific. They're uh, wonderfully done. These are, you know, uh, uh, bricket sticks on the backs of, um, of, of, of uh, are these, ch ch are these uh, yeah, Kieran's. Um, it's on the mounted onto this wood base, which is later. The wood base is not original, but these are very nice, beautifully done, and they've been, as you can see, they've been kept polished all these years. And of course, this is how they were. You know, originally when we talk, we see the patina on some bronzes. You think that's you know, it gets worn and old, warm and old. I mean, it's a it's a lovely effect. I like old patinas, and many of you do. You like old patinas on wood and so forth. But there's also a school of thought for people that brought, polished them because this is what they were meant to look like when they were first made. They weren't meant to go all dark and patinated necessarily. They were meant to be kept shiny and bright uh, to look sort of like gold. Uh, that was sort of the idea. The way that pewter used to look, pewter, uh, antique uh, English and, and uh, American and French pewter. Um, they, people used to, that owned pewter used to polish pewter constantly uh, so it shined like silver. And it was poor man's silver. That that was the, the reason churches had uh, often, before they could afford to have silver chalices, they would have pewter chalices. And before they could afford to have pewter chalices, old churches in America, there was one in particular I know, they had a wooden, the oldest, it was the oldest um, um, uh, church bowl in America. It was in Massachusetts. It was discovered from a church in Danvers. And it was a piece of wood. It was a treenware bowl that they had painted gray so it would look like silver. Um, they were hoping, to, they were emulating silver. Um, and then later they graduated and eventually could afford to buy pewter. And then as the church got more money, they bought silver. But that was sort of the progression. And the same thing with bronzes. Um, uh, there were certain types of bronzes, uh, especially in, in religious environments, that were meant to be kept polished and clean and respected. And this is it. And these are, I think I've said too much probably, but at any rate, um, uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, this is a, a really nice um, uh, pair of prickets. Beautiful, beautiful casting, beautiful condition, and I really like these. I like these a great deal. I think they're very nice. They're about seven inches tall, or six inches tall, rather. Um, they're only, they just came on. There's eight days to go. They close in a week. We're going to keep them on the newsletter page. Um, they're only up to about $14, three bids. They should bring 1500 to 2000 all day long. Um, but we'll see what happens at the end. And they may go over that. They might even bring three or 4000 They're absolutely beautiful. All right, now over to this. This is sort of an interesting lot. This, this is a, a, a looks like a, a piece of a, a, a pottery out of the a, a example out of the Guangdong Xiwan area with this flambe glaze. Uh, and and the seller isn't isn't giving this any really much information. Rare and unusual Chinese antiques hair furs vase. It's not a hairs fur glaze, but he's do. I think he's just doing the best he can. Where is he selling out of the UK? I don't know him. He's only got. Um, 68 feedback. So he's probably just doing, he's doing the best he can. No bam, damage or repairs. That's the most important thing to do with this. All right. <clears throat> now, he doesn't put a date in here because I don't think he probably knows. This is a Ming piece. This is Ming. Um, and it's Shuan ware, I suspect, uh, judging by the, uh, the, the, the bottom, the glaze, and so forth. Beautifully, beautifully done. And um, I happen to own one. I'm going to pull it up here. <clears throat> Um, nearly identical, um, but this has a Zizou gl white glaze on it, and this was a type of piece that was made in the uh, uh, sort of the mid late Ming Dynasty. They turn up. I've owned this one for many many years. Um, I bought it from a friend of mine who's a dealer, and uh, lovely example. And this is this is another example of it. Okay, and uh, it was a, a pretty popular form in the 15th and 16th century. So uh, we'll see what it, put it down without breaking it. Um, yeah, it's normally sitting up here on the shelf. Many of you recognized it probably, but I just wanted to share it. And so it's a Ming example. So this is a Ming piece of probably Shuan ware. Beautiful handles. I love the handles on this thing. Um, it is probably around a foot tall, roughly. Uh, oh, no, it's only, oh, it's a little smaller. Eight, eight inches tall, eight, eight, nine inches. It's a little under a foot, but a lovely example. And should bring 800, 700 to a thousand dollars. It's a very nice thing. It's got. Uh, it'll be on the newsletter page. Um, it's a, a nice, nice piece of a genuine old uh, uh, pottery. All right. And then this, the Canton Famille Rose Punch Bowl, uh, a very nice example. 
It's up to two hundred and fifty-five dollars, but it's a it's a, pr a pretty good-looking bowl, and uh, it measures uh, eleven and three-quarter inches in diameter. Closes in a couple of days. Closes on Sunday. And then over to this, the silver. This is one of the silver bowls that's uh, on there. Very finely done. Nice high relief. And the relief areas, the high relief areas are all polished out. Just absolutely terrific. And uh, there's a, there is a maker's mark on here. Um, it's made in Shanghai by Lian Huo. Um, and you can um, uh, you can look them up over on the in the reference section, over in the silver book, um, over there in, in the bookcase on on off the homepage. All right. Um, it's up to 340. This is probably going to go for 12 to 1500, but we'll see. Uh, and then this a nice, nice rank, rank badge, very pleasing colors on this nice, soft colors. It's up to $600. It'll probably go another few hundred, but very pleasing, soft, almost pastel -y colors, beautiful tones, nice condition. Um, it's a, a civilian rank badge, uh, like the fifth or sixth rank. And uh, very nice. And then this, I'm putting these in here. These I came across. I like Indian miniatures on ivory. You're not supposed to say the I word on eBay, but it is. It's ivory. It's over in the UK. And he's got two of these up, these these sort of export uh, tourist uh, watercolors on, on uh, ivory that they did of famous people of the day. Um, and there are lots of them that were done. They're very beautiful. And uh, they're nice to have around. They're all hand painted. And then this, the monochrome blue crackle brush popper. This is, again, Stubsy Wubsy got this. Nice blue color with a crackle in it. Uh, this is a late Qing, later Qing example, second half of the 19th century from what I'm seeing. it's It's got a day to go. It's only up to 32 pounds or about 40 bucks. Uh, it should jump. It should, it should, it closes on Sunday. It should bring four or 500 anyway, but right now it's in the bargain field. So go over and give it a bid. And then this, this uh, really nice boxwood carving. This is NZ guy over in the UK. He's been a seller on there for years and years and years. And he gets, there's a lot of stuff. And every once in a while he gets something really nice. And uh, my, my interest in old wood carvings uh, got me onto this thing. <coughs> Very nice piece of boxwood. Beautiful, beautiful details around the face. It's got a couple of body cracks in it, which is sort of common with boxwood. It's almost it, it, with a wood. Central heat causes these cracks to form. Uh, if I got this, I'd put it in the most humid room in my house and leave it there for a year um, and let it get some moisture back in. It'll help close up those cracks. But um, And that's all it really does. Ivory will do the same thing for you. If you own an ivory collection in the winter, um, many, many years ago, um, the, the, the uh, author, uh, Carl Crossman, um, who wrote the book, The China Trade. I, I knew Carl pretty well. And uh, he used to put his ivory collection. He had a lot of amazing Chinese export ivory ware. And he would put it, keep it in his uh, the bathroom, his primary bathroom, where he showered and, and all that. He, he, would kept, he kept all the ivory on shelves in that bathroom during the winter so the moisture wouldn't wreck them. Uh, it was pretty funny. Any rate, because I saw the, I saw the stuff on shelves in his bathroom once. And I said, "Why do you keep all your ivory in the bathroom?" He said, "It's winter. You don't want it to crack." And I said, "Okay, makes sense." <clears throat> but anyway, this is a nice piece of boxwood, beautifully done. Nineteenth um, century, I agree with uh, with, with an immortal. Um, it is uh, how tall is it? Twenty six centimeters tall, so it's pretty good size. It's about ten inches tall. It's a nice size one. There's a sprite can to give you some idea. Uh, I like that a lot. And uh, then there's this. This is <clears throat> probably a 19th century, mid, later Edo period incense burner, but it's done in the form of a summarized bronze answer, helmet. And when I first looked at it, I said, Jesus, that's an odd looking thing, but it's real. Um, and it's it, this is one of these oddball things that they did um, from time to time in Japan, like everywhere else. There's the interior of it. That surface and patina looks absolutely fine. It doesn't look faked at all. Um, there's the rest of it. Um, this is a really interesting, cool thing. The bottom of it looks good. Lots of natural wear in all the right places. Um, but the, the, the surface on this looks very good to me. Beautiful, beautiful old surface. And they have, have the, the, the mask mount on the front here with the eyes and, and the mouth and the nose guard on the, on the figure and so forth. And there it is. Um, really cool thing. So if you like Japanese stuff and you maybe collect Japanese uh, military stuff, this is this is a really nice thing to think about, um, and it's 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 not at some crazy price. It's only up to seventy five dollars. It closes Sunday. Um, it is uh, how big is it? It's it's pretty good size actually, uh, as I recall. It's like six inches or seven inches across. Um, no repairs, no damage, uh, free delivery. It seems to me I saw the dimensions on here somewhere. 
Oh, there it is, 18 centimeters wide. It's, right, it's actually in the listing. So it's about seven inches in width. So it's pr pretty good size. Pretty good size for that. $75 ought to bring six to 800. This thing is cool. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, very interesting thing. And then um, uh, uh, the uh, another one, I think this, no, this is the same one. I guess some reason got that up tw uh, twice, I guess, the, uh, the rank badge. Um, no, it's a different rank badge. He's got blue feathers. This is another one. This is um, Haru has this up. It's up to 335. Again, nice soft colors. Um, should bring, you know, 600 to $800 by the time it's done, but worthwhile to collect, worthwhile collecting that. All right. And so there it is. And there's a lot more, um, this week that'll be in there. So if you haven't done it yet, come over to the newsletter page and uh, check it out. We do it every, what is, what is the, this is the 488th week we've done this. Wow. A lot, a lot of those, huh? Um, <laughs> Uh, and if you if you and if you come over, you can subscribe. You hit this thing here today, and you just uh, drop in your email address, and you'll get the uh, update notification um, as soon as it goes out on Friday. Once we get the video done and we get this page finished, we got a few more things to do on this page before we're done. And as soon as we're done, we uh, we use constant contact. We do never share email addresses. If any of you are wondering, um, a couple of you asked me if you could rent them, um, rent rent our email our address book, and we don't rent. We do not rent our email list we've got thousands and thousands of people on there and i've always said we don't run it we don't share it we don't do any of that so keep that in mind if, you, if you're if you're wondering where it goes it's stored on a server that we pay for and it's not on some public venue it's on our it's on our server at constant contact in our own space and uh it's not available to the public but anyway that's 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 what we're doing and uh, if you want to sign up you can and subscribe to it uh uh, and you'll stay in touch once a week. We don't barrage you with emails. We just send out one every Friday, typically, unless something special comes up. If something really good comes up, we might do a, a, a separate email um, to everybody just to let them know about something, if something really good happens. But that doesn't happen all that often during the course of the, usually the, everything can wait until Friday when we get get this thing done. All right, so that's it. And uh, we're working on, I'm working on a video uh, and I hope to get it out next week, but it, we, we got tied up with something here this week and had to go out on the road for a day. Um, we're going to um, uh, talk about Falun Kai, Fen Kai, Yang Kai, and what those words mean exactly and how they relate to Famille Rose, Famille Jun, Famille Noir, and the, the verbal nomenclature that it, it's easy to get tripped up on it. And uh, I we're going to put together a little quick explainer video or an information video on that and the origins of those colors and why they're called what they are. And then um, going ahead, when you see the words used, you'll know what they what, what they mean if they're being used properly. All right. So thanks for watching. Have a great week. This was sort of a long one today. Apologize. Uh, have a good weekend. And uh, I'll see you all uh, next week. I'm probably going to put, put up a couple of videos on a few things. And uh, the newsletter uh, page is updated. And the global member pages uh, were updated yesterday. We took out, there were a bunch of sales. We've added back a bunch of sales. There's a couple of pretty good things in there. Uh, if you're a subscriber, go out and check it out. The U.S. and the EU pages. We've got a, a couple of things that are going on in the EU, some nice items. And there's a, a number of things in the U.S. that are coming up that look awfully good, too. So, uh, and it's summertime, so you have the chance at, at getting a particularly good buy. All right, that which is the fun part. All right, see you all next time. Thanks so much for uh, uh, watching, and bye-bye uh, for now. Bye-bye.